Hello again, rail fans. You know, it's pretty exciting when we see foreign power on a train. That is, locomotives from other railroads on our local lines that we always see. Now, there are a lot of reasons for this, but the two biggest ones are simplicity and efficiency. This has been happening now for over 40 years, but, well, before we go any further, let's get out to the tracks for a better look. Rolling into Tampa on this cloudy afternoon is train G126, a unit grain train newly created in November 2021 for a brand new flour mill on Tampa Bay's eastern shore. But why is this CSX train being pulled by foreign line BNSF engines? This is called run-through power. This train originates on the BNSF in Salina, Kansas and comes down to Birmingham, Alabama where BNSF interchanges it to CSX for the rest of its run to Tampa. Out of BNSF's East Thomas Yard in Birmingham, G126 comes south and east on the CSX Lineville sub to Manchester, Georgia. From there, it continues down the Fitzgerald sub to Waycross, the Jessup sub to Folkestone, the Nahunta sub to Callahan, the Callahan sub to Baldwin, the Wildwood sub to Zephyr Hills, and the Yeoman sub to Tampa. From the earliest days of railroading, right up through the late 1970s, railroads only used their own locomotives on their own rails. There were some passenger trains that used interchange power, but very seldom on freights. Many through freights went to destinations on foreign lines, but when they reached the interchange point, that is where one railroad ended and a new one began, the new railroad's crews, engines, and cabooses were put on the train for the rest of the trip. As locomotives became more standardized, railroads learned that leaving the originating engines on certain trains could save time and money. Rather than taking all the time and manpower to cut off locomotives at the interchange and put on their own, they discovered it was cheaper to just let the originating road's power pull the train all the way to the destination and all the way back. Single commodity trains, those hauling just one product between one shipper and one customer, were the most likely candidates for the run-through practice. And so, you'll often see foreign power on unit grain trains, ethanol trains, and mineral trains, and up until recently, coal trains. These loaded tanks of ethanol come to Tampa once or twice weekly from Illinois, often with originating Canadian National, Canadian Pacific, or even Union Pacific power. It depends on which supplier the ethanol comes from and which railroad they originate from. In exchange for the number of hours that CSX uses the foreign engines on its portion of the trip, they will either pay the foreign railroad in cash or run their own engines on through freights to the foreign road for an equal number of hours. Each railroad keeps track of locomotive hours spent on foreign roads. Sometimes, after a foreign engine reaches its destination, the railroad will cut it off and use it on other jobs. I was set up one morning in Lakeland at the Winston Y, and in came Q603 with a Union Pacific AC44CW in the third position. Now, this ain't no run-through train. 603 originates daily in Waycross, Georgia, and comes down to Winston. So that UP engine got into the yard mix on some unit train, was cut off somewhere and got into regular freight service. The CSX power desk will likely get it back on a train to UP home rails as soon as they can. But right now, it's going to spend the day in Lakeland, Florida. A second G126 train came the following day. The flour mill wasn't finished with unloading the first train, so they had to hold out this guy until the plant was cleared. Nights on the Yeoman Sub, 20 miles out of Tampa, is the nearest passing siding that would hold this train without having to cut a lot of crossings. It gave me the chance to get a close-up look at those BNSF locomotives, and in pretty good light. On that first G126 train we saw earlier in Tampa, the distributed power on the bottom was also BNSF, but it was being cut off and headed off to Winston Yard in Lakeland. Maybe CSX was going to service them at the Winston Locomotive Service Center. Or maybe they were going to use that power for some local work while the grain train was being unloaded down at Big Bend. When we come back, we're taking a little day trip to Baldwin, Florida, where the holiday shopping peak and the crew shortage have got things jumping. 
It's the late night side of morning on a Saturday after Thanksgiving as I strike out up I-275 to get out of Tampa and into busier territory. Weather people have called for sunny skies all over the state today. So far, so good. On to State Road 52 toward Dade City and the S-Line, and the bonus of being up this early becomes apparent. A light fog has set down over the cattle ranches as we near Ridge Manor. At St. Catherine, a southbound surprises me. The darn radio was turned down, so I missed hearing the Bushnell defect detector. It was A981, the Stark Local A781, but on an alternate schedule, and not going to Stark either. He had made a beeline out of Baldwin this morning straight for Winston Yard at Lakeland. He was sizable too, 680 axles. This was a special train. The sun was high when I stopped at Lottie to check out their old Seaboard Airline Depot. I've been through here more than a hundred times and never stopped to see it. Mike Robbins grabbed a picture of the depot when it sat along the Seaboard main line next to the iconic side-by-side -side signals that marked downtown Lottie forever. Threatened with a move-it-or-lose-it order from CSX, the city of Lottie moved the depot a half block over to its property on County Road 200A. Also of interest to me was the road marker on the street. This was the Florida State road marker design for decades. Counties took over maintenance of many secondary roads in the 70s, and thus the county sticker at the bottom and a faded C covering the S. Have I ever mentioned that I like signs? As I neared Baldwin, I got a tip from rail fan Ryan Stokes, who was there. The Florida Gulf and Atlantic had a train preparing to depart going west. Downtown McClenny, Florida, X Seaboard Airline, X Seaboard Coastline, X CSX SP Line, now the FGA Tallahassee, Maine, and another foreign power catch, though it doesn't look much like it. This is a loaded grain train, covered hoppers for the Pilgrim's Pride feed mill in Live Oak, Florida. The train rides most of its trip on the CSX, so even though it was interchanged to the FG&A at Baldwin, the two railroads elect to keep the originating power on for the last 62 miles to the destination. FG&A likely has a deal to credit CSX for the power hours, or they pay them cash. After that, I drifted back east the nine miles to Baldwin to see something I'd heard about the day before. Christian Johnson posted a drone picture on the Florida Railfan Facebook group, a shot that stunned many of us. CSX had removed the railroad crossing that marked the town of Baldwin for 161 years. For the first time since 1860, Dr. Abel Seymour Baldwin's Florida Atlantic and Gulf Central Railroad, now the SP Line, no longer crosses Senator David U. Lee's Florida Railroad, now the Wildwood and Callahan subs of the S Line. No doubt a cost-saving move by CSX, as the diamond was hardly, if ever, used anymore. Diamonds are expensive appliances. The more of them you can do without, the better off for your bottom line. Still, it's sad to see anything like this end. We'll get back to work chasing trains right after this. Bill. Under four is a come by there, Pickle. Uh, under four, I'll, I'll catch it when you get here. Three and a half miles south of Baldwin Yard is Maxville. Ryan Stokes and I shot down here to catch Q441. The conductor got a ride down here after they had tripled out their train. The engineer is now slowing to less than four miles per hour, a speed required by the rules for safe boarding. And Mr. Conductor steps aboard. Up and clear, uh, 3124. Four. 441 is better than 13,000 feet today. Normally an evening job from Waycross to Tampa, he's running in daylight today. Two, four, one, two, clear, just to Highland. Back to 3124. Go ahead and start up. Back up to Baldwin Yard, where a coal train was coming in. The crew was pulling it out from the West Baldwin siding. It had been parked there, waiting on a new crew all night. NO40 is an as-needed coal train out of Oaktown, Indiana, for Orlando's Stanton Power Plant. 
This crew will take it as far as Stokes Siding, just north of Lakeland, where a local crew will take it on as 0800 to the power plant. Back to the now former Baldwin Diamond area called Baldwin Tower, even though there's no tower here anymore and no diamond either. Inbound was Q203, loaded auto racks out of Louisville, Kentucky. The yardmaster had held him out for most of an hour while they made some room for him in the yard. Baldwin has been almost full all day. 203 would break up his train into sections and back them into several yard tracks for other trains to pick up, including tomorrow's 441 for Tampa, 453 for Palm Center, and 455 for Orlando. This is the practice called block swapping. An old Baldwin yard has proven its value in making it happen. Without the diamond here, the neighbors to the southeast should be pretty happy. No more hammering train wheels at all hours of the day and night. The shadows were getting longer now and the temperature falling, so I broke off and headed south. The first stop was in Stark at Wani Junction. Northbound Q452 was pounding northward out of Miami and Wildwood for Baldwin and Waycross. Once in a while, a soft spot will illustrate just how heavy these machines are. That's 132-pound rail flexing like aluminum foil. After that, I moved on south, and at Waldo, I spotted something you don't see that often anymore. A single car in a line-side storage track. This is called a bad order. That's railroad jargon for equipment taken out of service for need of repair. This tank car may have a stuck brake, a bad axle hub, or an excessively flat wheel. The defect detector may have caught it, and the train crew limped it here to the first storage track available. CSX will send out a shop truck from either Stark or Baldwin to repair the car. The compressed springs on the trucks tell us this car is loaded, which probably will make this a higher priority repair. The load is apparently something called polyol. I, I don't know what that is. When it's fixed, one of the road freights will be assigned to stop here and pick it up. This old storage track is a little part of Florida's history. It's all that remains of the Florida Railroad's yard and its main line to Gainesville and Cedar Key. While not even a spur track anymore, the track is still earning its keep as an emergency lodge for bad orders. Now, of course, this isn't the original track or ties. Those have probably been replaced several dozen times in the decades since the Florida Railroad days. Two weeks earlier, I was searching for foreign power and found none. But I did stop at a good place for lunch, Steph's Southern Soul Restaurant in Dade City. I had a kind of seafood platter with a crab cake, fried shrimp, and catfish fried in cornmeal breading, mac and cheese, black-eyed peas, and hush puppies on the side. I also had a piece of sweet potato pie for dessert. Fantastic! Staff's is just a block west of the tracks at MLK Boulevard and 5th Street in Dade City. Now to repeat just one more time, when we say foreign power, we mean locomotives from other railroads here in the country, not locomotives from foreign countries. Just to clear that one up. Foreign power is considered a worthwhile catch by most rail fans. It's something new, it's something different. I get email from folks out west and telling me how excited they are when they see CSX locomotives on their BNSF and Union Pacific uh, lines there locally in their hometown. It's all in what's new, what's different, what's unusual. Now please hit the like button if you like this video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done that. Write your comments in the comments section down below. I try to read them all. I try to reply to as many as I can. So please do that. 
So until we see each other again somewhere out there on the high iron, this is Danny Harmon, out. <laughs>